So on your agenda, it says that uh, there'll be in-depth discussion on biologists. <laughs> Page one. <laughs> uh, you should have gotten a memo uh, that Matt Galvin sent out uh, uh, when I was in the meeting. Uh, went through the uh, major changes. Uh, so, just a little process. Um, CCM staff helped us a lot. We reviewed the bylaws of uh, at least 30 different uh, uh, sister agencies around the country. Uh, kind of picked, and picked out and looked at uh, areas of bylaws that we thought were, were good. We had some good, healthy discussion. And there were a couple of issues that we decided to leave aside for now, uh, like uh, the weighted voting, uh, because it really hadn't been an issue in our, in our history. Uh, at least I know of only one weighted vote of, uh, of towns versus uh, based on population. And that was uh, over the income tax. So, um, I think uh, that was long enough ago that it doesn't seem to be enough of an issue. We have to also respect that uh, um, something the other cities do pay more dues, and we have to respect that that, that may mean that they have uh, some entitlement uh, to uh, a way to go. Um, so I'm going to walk through a couple of the, the significant changes and then open up for questions. Um, first off, we built on our uh, strategic uh, uh, retreat and uh, our strategic plan, so we structured our organization to match the plan. Uh, we thought if we want to move forward, we have to have uh, agents of change within the organization that accept the responsibility. So um, we highlighted uh, those uh, strategic issues um, that we have uh, a a group for advocacy of, um, and a group for looking at uh, our affiliations of different members and set up our structures to do that. So what we're talking about doing is if you choose to adopt the uh, bylaws today, uh, they will go into effect in, in January, in uh, July, and we would change our election process to be a January term so that a new uh, slate can come in, have time to prepare the budget, for the following slide. Um, it also allows us to get uh, away from putting a, a board in place in July and having some people who may decide not to run again or the, the public decides that they're not allowing them to run again uh, and we elected. So we've had that uh, also happening. So this will allow us to make sure that the people that are in office in November could take the seat in January. So if you brought the bylaws with you, um, you know, the mission, the purpose and mission is right out of that strategic group uh, retreat. Uh, advocacy for municipal issues, education, including convention and training seminars, etc. Services and products to our members, and partnering with other entities. So those are the four key strategic issues that we're going to be looking for. That's part of CCM's mission. We are requiring uh, an ongoing strategic planning issue. Uh, at minimum, every five years, we need to look at who we are and where, where we want to go and where we've been. One of the major changes, uh, we're trying to make a commitment that if you're part of CCF, they can make a commitment and show up at meetings and show up on the, the board. So attendance will count if you're looking to be an officer of the organization. Um, we kind of changed some of our affiliations and created a position of honorary member uh, so that we can bring in some people with expertise that may no longer be the, the chief uh, executive officer of the organization, um, but we want to be able to share their years of experience. Um, and um, then in terms of the board of directors, we narrowed the number of people on, on the, as officers of the organization. We're going to have a president proposing a president, a first vice president, and a second vice president. We'll get into their duties in a second. Um, but currently, uh, we also have a secretary and a treasurer. Um, so we created the second vice president with that position and are putting the role of secretary and treasurer on the executive director. The bylaws also uh, deal with the uh, past president issue. As you're aware, um, you could be a 
past president be on the board for life. Um, you want to make sure that you're tied to the town. And uh, again, at some point, you can then become an honorary member uh, instead um, to provide your wisdom um, to the organization. Um, so, <coughs> actual uh, duties. The president at CCM, um, I think everyone knows uh, the duties of you know, the president and the chair of the meetings. Um, but the president of the CCM will also be uh, in charge of the advocacy group. Um, and there's also the committee on advocacy. The first vice president, um, um, so the advocacy group and the executive, uh, we'll also have an executive committee, I'm sorry. Uh, which is uh, made up of the officers and three at-large members, so we're opening that up. Uh, so other members, right now it's kind of a closed group, so we're gonna bring in people um, that will in some ways replace part of the budget and personnel committee. Um, the duties of the personnel committee will be with this executive committee. We will have the finance and audit committee uh, also. So policy and advocacy will be chaired by the president. The first vice president will chair the finance and audit committee. We formerly haven't had a real audit committee, so that's something that we need to do. Uh, Kerma has, uh, CCM really hasn't. Uh, we've kind of overlapped and used Kermas to, to look at CCM's audit on an annual basis. The member services and education committee will be chaired by the second vice president, and we've done an ad hoc nominating committee every year. So what we're doing is taking leadership and putting them in charge of these committees so that as you move up the ranks towards being the president, you'll have gone through the whole system uh, and knowing the full work of CCM organization and the duties and responsibilities. Um, we have talked briefly about maybe a two-year term for president, and again, set that aside uh, due to the uncertainty of elections, and also the need to, to let people kind of uh, bring their ideas and their, their concepts and the willingness to serve up, and we thought that at, at least at this point, We'd set that aside uh, and that we looked at it some point later and felt we needed to do that. But we felt we gained experience by the, the, the chairmanship uh, uh, model that we're proposing. A uh, couple other changes. Um, there will be a conflict of interest statement that we're going to ask board members to sign. Uh, people on Perma have already done that. But uh, we are a uh, uh, nonprofit organization, we have certain issues. We're not subject to FOI. Uh, we have certain issues that uh, need to have a free flow and dialogue with board members, and sometimes that uh, does not need to go public. We need to create an atmosphere of open and honest communication at the board level, and uh, kind of like the Las Vegas rule, what happens at the board meetings stay at the board meetings. Uh, it doesn't mean that we can't communicate necessarily with other CCM members. Uh, but over the past few years, we've experienced a lot of neighborhoodism by people taking their own personal agendas to uh, blogs and uh, in the press. And that has not helped the organization as a whole. Um, so those are the key issues that I wanted to, uh, to touch upon and certainly would be glad to uh, answer questions. John, just on the date of when the bylaws take effect, since the change of uh, from five officers to three isn't happening until December or January or like sometime after the November election. Should the bylaw change? Is that when the bylaw change should be effective? Otherwise, you know, change the bylaws and, and uh, without making too many issues with uh, officers. That's a good question. Yeah. Um, I think the bylaws need to go into effect for January 1. Okay, that was, somebody said, I thought you said July 1, that's why I. The, on an annual basis. Okay. Uh, the, we'll still have a July 1 fiscal year. I'm sorry if I okay. misconvened okay. that. But we need to get in place some of those executive committees, though, uh, as transition. But uh, I leave it to uh, discussion in terms of whether the effective date should be July 1 or, or January 1 uh, for the bylaws. Um, but I think as a transition, uh, we may want to get some of those committees going. Uh, oh, just the question is the date. And have temporary, temporary board members. You're absolutely right, because later on we're going to elect yeah. maybe six months. 
uh, terms of the uh, existing board is the suggestion. Um, and it may be that we take the, the people and slot them in as the temporary head of those committees. Well, we'll have to reach a decision on that. I make a motion to approve the bylaw changes. Second. Move in a second. Bill Shane Chuck, second it. Further discussion? We'll need to, before we vote on it, decide on the fact of date. Um, if I could opine just back, I, I get where Herb is coming from, but if we made an effective July 1, does that effectively wipe out the seats of the current board that we're extending for six months? I guess it would, right? So that's the problem. That was the question. That's the problem, yeah. Um, so I guess we'd have to make an effective January 1 with the understanding that these would be informal working groups. Or we modify the, the slate of officers, uh, and I think I'm the... You're on the chopping block. I, I think I would, be, <laughs> I would be the person on the chopping block, but I'd uh, be, because we're going to eliminate one. Just a friendly motion would be that the, the bylaws take effect July 1, and those bylaws relating to officers should take place on January 1. All right, so we have a transitional officers. I think what we need to make clear, and, and the, the board would need to, to decide uh, what officer would be assigned as interim first vice president, interim second vice president, so they could get those committees uh, going. I would agree with that. So I the bylaws should be effective immediately, but the transition of the offices would be in January to the new offices. Uh, this group here had made a lot of changes. I'd like to keep them through transition so we can set up the committee and then come November, we start forward with the new uh, set of officers. I think so that was the, the gist of what we're trying to do here. So there's a friendly amendment. Is there a second to the friendly amendment? Second. Total oh, feature. <laughs> <laughs> Further discussion? I want to really thank the uh, um, CCM staff, uh, Juanette in particular. Uh, for helping us. I know there's a lot of work and the committee uh, also had a lot of meetings, so before we take a vote, I just want to express appreciation for all this that helped with the bylaws. So all in favor of amending the bylaws effective January 1st, say aye. 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 Um, any opposed? I think they're uh, adopted yeah. effective uh, July 1st. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'll be great again, I promise. Even though I'm Irish, I'm just saying dance and talk, and I'm, I'm good. Um, I guess during the next transition implementation plan, as it goes to bylaws, that this board has a lot of work to start trying to bring some uh, new uh, life into CCM. And I think what we're going to do is we have a board meeting uh, right after this to try and sit down. I think what's happening at the legislative committee is very important to that group. As you know, we're still uh, fighting the fight up at the East Capitol, but also during the summer, I think we'd like to get that legislative group really going full blast and, and being prepared. Uh, we usually wait till September, October, and we start having this uh, rush to get things done. Uh, we're really hoping to get that legislative group done now so that we can uh, see what's going, keep current, and then see what we need to do in the future. So, uh, John, I want to thank you for your hard work and your committee, and I want to thank also the committees that have put together, Leo, your committee, and hiring uh, our, our executive director. And again, uh, this time with Jefferson once said, you only fit the people around you, and we have a lot of good people here with staff and board members that uh, got this work done this year. So at this point, I think what I'd like to do is introduce our chairman of the committee, Leo Paul. Uh, see, I got it right this time. Yes. And, um, <laughs> which we'll talk about the nominating committee report. Thank you very much, man. I appreciate this. And uh, uh, before I get started, Barbara told me I got to tell a joke. <laughs> to warm the room up a little bit. Where's Barbara? I know she's here somewhere. <laughs> oh, there she is. Uh, no, not no, no, uh, Anyway, here's the joke. Get you ready for summer. This young girl's planning to go out to Martha's Vineyard for the summer. So she goes and she buys, goes to the store, and comes home with a bikini, tries it out in front of her mom. Says, Mom, what do you think? 
Mother says, I don't think you should be wearing that bikini in Martha's Vineyard over the summer. She says, but why not? It's very, very nice. She says, well, if I had worn that bikini, if I had worn that bikini when I was there for the summer, you'd be five years older than you are now. <laughs> I hope that wasn't too risky. <laughs> well, <laughs> Keep your day job. A, a, you know, a priest, a Catholic priest, a little bit of joke. That's what goes on in Lichfield. Uh, anyways, as the chairman of the nominating committee, uh, the first order of business here is to uh, uh, nominate and uh, assign to the proposed uh, CCM officers and directors. I'm not going to read the entire list. Uh, you have it up on the screen there. Um, I'll be happy to answer any questions anybody might have. If there's none, I'll look for a motion to approve the slate. I'll make that motion. There's a motion been made. Is there a second? A second? Any questions or comments, anyone? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Uh, we've got a couple of other uh, business items here that we've got to take care of. First is, uh, and I'll read the thing, resolution concerning the appointment of additional members to the Board of Directors of the Connecticut Commerce and Municipalities. Whereas Article 5, Section 1A of the Revised Bylaws of the Connecticut Commerce and Municipality provides that there shall be directors of the conference in such number as the conference shall annually determine by resolution. This number shall not count officers and past presidents. Resolved that the CCM membership authorizes the Board of Directors to appoint additional di directors as appropriate, as long as the number of directors shall not exceed 21. Is there a motion to approve that resolution? Has so a motion been made? Is there a second? Second. There's a second. Any comments, questions, anyone? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? Motion carries. One more resolution. Oh, this is easier than my selected things. <laughs> Our resolution concerning the number of directors of the Connecticut Conference and Municipalities. Whereas Article 5, Section 1A of the Revised Bylaws of the Connecticut Conference and Municipalities provides that there shall be directors of the conference such number as the conference shall annually determine by resolution. This number shall not count officers and past presidents. Resolved that the number of directors shall not exceed 21 in addition to the officers and the past presidents. Is there a motion to approve that resolution? Second. Motion, is there a second? Second. Second. Comments, questions, anyone? All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Leo, thanks again for uh, chairing this. Uh, Leo's been chairing a lot of things lately because uh, he gets the job done. We appreciate that. Uh, next, what I'd like to do is have our executive director, Joe DeLong, talk about building on success. So uh, without further ado, here is our executive director, Joe. Thank you, Matt. This is uh, either the moment you've all been waiting for or perhaps the one you've all been dreading. I'm not sure which. Uh, I, was, I was speaking with our Director of Communications, Kevin Maloney, yesterday, preparing for this in the time slot that was allotted and everything, and Kevin said, well, the only advice I would give you is, great presenters always leave the audience wanting more. So I hope you have a good night. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, as a, as a time of, of transition, and the transition, I think, we're kind of through the transition, and now we're at a point of evolution. There's some important things that I want to discuss with you. And we're going to begin with just a quick snapshot of the association in terms of where we are. And why I say it, a quick snapshot in these areas is because quite frankly, from a financial position standpoint, just about a month ago, we had a business meeting where we set the budget, all the financials were emailed out to you. So you pretty much know that, that this association is on very solid financial footing. From a legislative force standpoint, we have LegCom meetings all the time. I don't want to turn this meeting into a LegCom meeting. There's a time and a place for that. We're going to talk about those things a little bit later on in the presentation, but we're not going to go into great detail. Again, the first part of this is just a high-level snapshot of these three areas. 
But a snapshot that I think is important. And I think it's important because it's putting some things in a context that maybe you already know, but perhaps you really haven't thought about. And to some degree, some of these things in this snapshot are a complete tribute to the people in this room under your leadership and the association that you built. One reason why I'm going to talk about it too long, I've only been here three months, I can't take credit for any of this. So we'll get through it in a hurry. But from a financial position standpoint, dating back to 2008 to present, you had a 1% increase in your CCM dues. A one-time 1% increase. Now that's, that's pretty good, but when you put it in the, in the context, in the true perspective, during that time, we haven't reduced our number of staff. We haven't reduced our number of services or offerings. In fact, most of them have actually increased. Uh, CCM has not become a bad place to work. There's still opportunity for merit-based advancement. So you were able to hold the line with a one-time 1% 1 increase over these past seven or eight years um, without your organization declining in any way. Now to put that into perspective, during that same period of time, there was a 10% overall increase in inflation. So again, under your leadership and fiscal accountability, that's pretty impressive stuff and you should be proud of that. But to put it into a further perspective, to give you a sign of the times, the state legislative expenditures during that same period of time have increased by three billion, billion with a B, three billion dollars. Now you want to talk about your fiscal accountability, I'm going to give you some irony. The people on the $3 billion side of that slide that you're looking at, they want to put a spending cap on you because you're the problem. Yeah. Makes a whole lot of sense, doesn't it? Let's talk about our legislative position for a minute. As many of you know, I used to be a member of state legislature actually a state house majority leader years ago and i can tell you right now if i'm one one hundred as smart now as i thought i was then you were the luckiest people in the world to have it. but it was back in this time in the year 2000 when i was coming out of the primary election where i just defeated an 11 year incumbent and i was gearing up and getting ready for a general election with with tough opposition as well but during that same time, when I was in another state doing that, CCM was doing what it does every single year. It was hiring a fresh young crop of new interns. And one of those interns worked out so well and enjoyed their time here so much and enjoyed the opportunity and did such a great job that very shortly thereafter, <laughs> <laughs> they joined the staff as a full-time employee. <laughs> and, and I'll talk for just a moment about Bob. Bob Lebanera started off as an intern, became an associate, worked his way up to manager, and now he's the director of public policy and advocacy for CCM. And in those 15 or so years, he's been fighting the good fight the hard fight. He's been fighting for the education of our children. He's been fighting for maintaining our, our streets and our infrastructure. He's been fighting for economic viability in our towns. He's been fighting for public safety. He's been fighting to keep costs down on local property taxpayers. And he's been doing a really, really good job of it. But here's the bad part, or the unfortunate part, of when you have really good talent. Other people recognize it. And a month from now, Bob's going to be leaving us because he's been recruited to another position that provides tremendous opportunity for he and his family. He's earned that. But as, as part of our brief legislative update, I was hoping that you would just take a moment um, to join me in giving Bob a big round of applause. And thank you. Bob. Ladies and gentlemen, I tried to talk all of it to stay, but then after
contractor he was with, and I very quickly, based off the offer, and I found out he was going in the private sector. I then shifted the conversation to talking about this great MBA program that we have and some wonderful sponsorship opportunities we can bring you in here. As we, as we move along, and we talk very quickly about our core deliverables, the last of the snapshot of where we are. Again, I'm going to show you some things that you probably already know. Maybe you don't know them in this full of context, but I'm going to really try to, to capture them in a way that you need to think about in terms of what you have done as far as delivering services to your constituents. And that is, first of all, our energy electric purchasing program. Now, when I saw these numbers, I'm going to be honest with you, I questioned them. I didn't think they were accurate. Um, our new director of member services will tell you, I even brought her and said, I want to drill down on these because I'm not putting these up on the screen. They almost seem too good to be true to me. And then we looked at it and we drilled into it and we looked at the base rates for energy and electric costs based off of the contracts that they've been able to negotiate. And in the last fiscal year, that energy program has returned a savings of $10 million. Ooh, that, that's, that's quite frankly, of $10 million to your communities that participate in it. Now that's $10 million in savings that otherwise will be built into somebody's mill rate. And that's pretty impressive stuff. But when you think about that, here's the one thing about the general public. They don't necessarily recognize the good stuff that you do for them that's saving them money because the money is never coming out of their pocket to begin with. But this other program, the prescription drug program, this fiscal year is reducing your constituents' prescription drug costs across the state of Connecticut to a savings of two of six million dollars. I'm going to tell you why that's so important. Because of the association that you've built, and because of this program, out there today, there is somebody that does not have to make a difficult decision as to whether or not they can perform, afford their necessary prescription medication or put food on the table for their family. That's how important that is. Out there today, there's somebody who's not having to make a decision on whether they have to get a table knife and cut their pills in half or into quarters because they can't afford the next prescription to come and they have to drag it out longer than what it should be drug out. That's six million dollars worth of savings. That makes a real difference in the lives of the people within your communities. Now, I'll tell you something. Just these are just two programs. Again, this is just a snapshot. There's many more programs. But when you think about this, these two programs alone, without anything else that CCM does, these two programs alone deliver over a 400 percent return on the investment that it costs to run this association. Today, we're broadcasting some of this live over a Periscope back from Twitter. 400% return on your investment in the last year, two programs alone? Somewhere out there, Warren Buffett's really envious right now. <laughs> Say hi to them, clean it off. But it is very impressive, and it's a tribute to what you do. And it's a story that we need to tell, quite frankly. It's a story that's part of your goodwill and your good management and all of your efforts and all of your vision that has delivered this into your hometown and your communities. And they should know about it because they're the ones that are doing it for you. And I'm appreciative of the fact that you've done it as well. Now we're going to move on to where we go from here. So we talked about transition and evolution. And these are some of the really important things. We know what we've done, we know the good of this association. But we have to understand the opportunity. And the areas that we're going to look at for where we must go are just threefold. Number one, our organizational realignment. How do we structure for success? The next thing is the rebranding of CCM. It's our positioning in the marketplace that makes us more successful as we move forward. And finally, you know, I'm a big fan of, of Stephen Covey and the Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And one of those habits that's prominent within his teaching is begin with the end in mind. And we're going to talk about the vision, the vision of CCM from this point forward. Organizational realignment. When I was interviewed for this position, 
One of the interview questions that I was asked, and I can't recall who asked it, of me, pretty standard interview question, but somebody asked me, how do you perceive your first day on the job? Explain to us, Barbara Henry, she's the one raising her hand. Barbara Henry asked me, how do you perceive your first day on the job? So that was an easy question for me to answer because my first day on the job has always been the same with any organization or private sector company that I've run. What happens is when you have this change, everybody's wondering what's going on, how's the new boss going to be, am I going to like him, am I going to dislike him, what are the changes going to be, where do I fit into this organization? So what I do, first thing when I come into an organization is I have a staff meeting with all the staff. And I can't meet with all of them individually right out the gates, but I give them a high level overview of this is what to expect, I'm going to take time to meet with each one of you individually, here are the things that I'd like for you to think about before we have that meeting so you can discuss them with me. And generally just try to put the mind at ease that they're going to be a part of the transition process and I'm going to be inclusive and recognize all of their skills. But the second part that I do after that's over with is I immediately call a meeting with all of my division heads, all of my directors, the people that run the agency. To me, that's of vital importance because you have to understand the challenges, and you have to understand the opportunities, and you have to understand their individual vision and what they're in the middle of working on within their departments. So the first thing that I did was I got a hold of the current CCN organizational chart. And when it was given to me, I thought somebody handed me a picture of Charlie Brown's Christmas tree. If you look at this organizational chart and me calling a director's meeting, I had two, and one of them was vacant. So if I was going to call a meeting with my directors to talk about how we bring accountability to this organization and grow it from this point forward, that meeting was only going to be between myself and Ron Thomas. And it was also going to have to take place via cell phone because we're in the middle of a legislative session and Ron was at the Capitol. So unless I wanted to have a director's meeting with Ron, I was going to have a conversation with myself. So one of the first things that we had to do was look at the resources that we had and put ourselves in an organizational position that we could bring greater accountability, bring greater use of those resources, and move this, this association forward. And so we completely realigned the organizational chart. Now, one of the things that we did, as you see across this straight line, is we created within the positions that we had where everybody was just kind of fragmented all over the place trying to do stuff, we created individual accountable departments to have deliverables directly to you. So it was no longer what the CCM do for me. Each department had to be able to stand on its own and point out how it delivered services back to the membership that was paying for the association to exist. And those areas, of course, being uh, public policy, uh, government, government relations, communications, and then member services. But the other thing that we did, and we just pulled it back into the org chart, is you had this other area that was out there that was kind of pulled away that was called shared services. And I will, I will tell you, and one thing you don't like to do is come in and tell your organization that you're working for that hired you and your whole room of new bosses about things that you don't like. But I'll be honest with you, I hate that term. I absolutely think that that is a terribly regressive way to define those departments, to call them shared services. And I'll tell you why. They're basically comprised of finance, human resources, and IT. And by calling them shared services, we send a very clear message to them in our old structure that says, your deliverables from a finance, shared services, and IT perspective, and by the way, I say about the departments, it's not about the head of those departments. We have tremendous, tremendous talent in the directors of those three departments. The, the human resource aspect of those departments is phenomenal. But the teaching that we've given them is your deliverable is to the associations. It's to the operational side of CCM and it's to the insurance arm. You serve CCM operations, you serve insurance operations. All these people down below they also have to serve you. They have to be accountable to bring a deliverable back to you. Their deliverable is not just to the organization, it's to your individual cities and towns. Now the last time I checked, I'm assuming that all of your cities and towns have HR functions, have financial needs, and have to grow within the IT world. 
So why would we not be supporting that? So one of the first things we did is we created these individual areas of accountability and pulled them back in and said, we're going to bring individualized deliverables within each one of these departments. So one day, one day soon, the goal is that if there was only one of those yellow blocks up there and none of the other ones existed, that that department by itself could stand up in front of you and tell you why this association is important because of what they do and what they do alone. That your return on your investment is valid just in their individual area. That's how you bring accountability and that's how you grow. But the other thing that was happening within the, the old Charlie Brown Christmas tree model with only two departments, only two areas of accountability, is as narrow and as small as that was, those two worlds never met, which was just crazy. It was, this side does what it does, this side does what it does. And by the way, if we have to communicate with you, we both have our own communications budget. It doesn't stand alone. So member services is trying to grab communications and saying, push out this publication, push out this information. At the same time, the policy and advocacy side saying, no, we're in a legislative session. This is really important. We need you working over here. You push this out, so you push that out. And there was no coordination in between because those two worlds never collided. What our directors understand now is that while they each have to be in accountable individually, this is an iterative process from organizational realignment. And we are only as strong as our weakest link. That's how good organizations run. That's how they move forward. And so when you look at each one of these areas, when we talk about this term shared services that I don't like, we're gonna drill into trying to create things like HR portals where CCM is able to be linked right into your communities with best practices for HR, helping you with different resources for hiring and doing different things for training your new HR people, being a constant resource of information for your, your HR world. Finance, the same thing. We do all these workshops and seminars and trainings that we do through member services, but we don't link in our own finance department to do it. We're the association for all the towns and cities, and we're this great resource of information, then our finance department needs to grow and needs to be tied into our educational services that we're offering to your communities and your towns in terms of best practices, information sharing, IT services. We have the Nutmeg Network, that's incredibly underutilized in the state. Our IT staff needs to grow and be linking our association in with all of your cities and towns through the Nutmeg Network so we have the portals of information that we need to constantly push information out to you and create this super highway to where our office is sitting in your office every day and we're always accessible to you at any time without you even picking up the telephone. When we get into advocacy, we're going to take a new approach. We're going to be much more proactive when it comes to advocacy. The new bylaws are setting us up to do that. We're going to be out there in your community. And if we can't convince legislators of what makes sense, then we're going to convince their constituents what makes sense. Because this organization does a whole lot of really, really good things for the community. And once they learn more about the good things that we're doing for them and how we do it collaboratively, I think they're going to be more likely to look to us for solutions instead of all the constant bickering that we sometimes see go on in the state house. Member services standpoint, my new director of member services has already brought two new programs to the, to the table within our first couple weeks in, of work here. And we're going to continue to grow those programs and year in and year out, we're going to have new offerings that actually you can hold accountable and you can look at and you can see the true delivery uh, back into your, your hometowns and your constituents. Data and fiscal analysis. I'm so excited with the direction that we're heading here. There are only a couple of areas across the country that have municipal data management centers. We're building the, probably the only one that will exist for years in the Northeast. Not only will we support all of the state of Connecticut, but we will actually become a resource center when we start linking up with colleges and universities. Instead of just dealing with your phone calls and answering your, your data drilling questions, we're gonna do data mining to have this great brain of information that anybody can access to make public policy and, and governing better. 
One of these days, George Raphael, the director of this department, will no longer be on this earth. <laughs> wow. <Good. Have> <laughs> but when he's gone, his head will be preserved in a floating jar <laughs> in the front desk with the caption, the brains of CCM. That's where we're headed with this with this day George. Communications. Communications is so vital because it's not just about these other departments pushing information out to you. It's about how we communicate, not only with the legislature, and not only with our members, but with the people out in, the, in society that are so important to your success locally and to our success. That is what we're doing with our organizational realignment. We are bringing accountability to each one of these areas, where each one of these areas will have individualized deliverables. It will be an iterative approach where we'll work together as a team and it'll make things better for you in your, in your hometown. Now, rebranding. Two critical questions. If we want to rebrand ourselves, who should we reach, and how do we want to be perceived? Well, who we need to reach and how we should be perceived, other than what we're doing now, are the people external to our organization that the organization was built to support. It's the people in your communities. We want them to know who we are. We want them to know what we stand for. We want them to understand our ideas. They need to know how collaborative, again, that this association is. How we come together from all walks of life and we bring solutions to real life everyday problems that affect communities. We're going to put ourselves out there and we're going to rebrand our position so we're no longer just an internal association to you, but we're also externally pushing out all of the good work and all of the good deeds that you create within your communities, and we're selling that to people so we have a stronger position. But here's the, the tricky part of that. As you rebrand, how do you not just become the tree that falls into the woods? Nobody hears it because they don't know if it ever truly makes a sound. I don't know if you can read the caption where it says tree mobsters, but the one says, I didn't hear anything, you hear anything? No one says, I didn't hear anything. Well, here's the problem. Here's how you become that tree that falls in the woods. When you talk about things that make sense, like collaboration and working together and having better government and driving solutions, the people who you need to help push that message out, they're bored with it because it doesn't sell. What sells is, silliness and controversy and so we can push this positive message and say this is the way that we do things this is the way that we make things better and we can get out in the community and talk about that stuff and our message can be the absolute right message and the best message for all of government but if we're not careful we're the tree that falls in the woods and it gets lost in all of the noise so how does that not happen this is happening. Perhaps the most important part of this presentation. It's the elephant that's in the room. How do you have... It's not your something you just say, is that ever That's a Republican. That's a Republican. See, see, I'm not even talking about Republicans and Democrats here. We're going with it. The problem with addressing the elephant in the room is everybody thinks that you're supposed to do it or you want to do it or you're brave about doing it, but people have different ideas of who the elephant is. And when you start to address one person's elephant in the room and somebody else thinks, well, that's not the elephant, this over here is the elephant, then it shuts everything down. We're going to address the elephant in the room. We're going to do it this year and we're going to do it going forward. And I will tell you this. I'll warn you right now, some people are going to be a little uncomfortable about that, but it's what we have to do. It's how we have to get better. We have to have these conversations. You know, I'm reminded back home, I knew a, a Catholic priest and I knew a rabbi. This is, this is a joke, this is a true story. <laughs> I knew a Catholic priest and I knew a rabbi, and I knew both of them fairly well, and they lived on the same block and their kids went to school together and they were very good friends. Priest and rabbi were friends and their family were friends. 
And every year, I think every year, most of every year, they went on a little family vacation together, the two families. And they enjoyed each other's company, and they laughed, and they slapped each other on the back, and they had a good time, and their families loved one another, and they did things together, and one thing they just didn't do was talk about religion. Because it's how everything just stayed peaceful that way. We just respect our differences and not talk about it. We don't have that luxury. As elected representatives, as an association that represents the people, we have to talk about our differences, and we should because we're better at talk about, talking about them than any other group out there is. I want to tell you a little bit about explaining something about the elephant in the room that I've seen in just the last couple of months. And this is just one. There's many. And I'm going to keep you here all night to talk about the other ones. You're just going to see us address them. But the last couple of months, you've got leaders in the legislature, all legislators, I'm just going to zone in on one side of one, one body and zone in on the Senate. You have a majority leader, you have a minority leader. Both of them carry the tag after their name, leader. I don't know if they really know what that means in all states at all times, but there's a reason why they're called leaders. Heads of their party. Well, we were doing a, a press conference about mandates and the cost of pushing mandated cost out on the towns and how they could affect their budgets and how we didn't want this stuff to negatively impact people's property taxes and we questioned the sustainability about it and we really thought that before leaders should be doing this that they needed to sit down and have a discussion with us the majority leader started sending out tweets saying essentially i stand proudly with special interest worker groups Okay. And the message was very clear. Doesn't matter what the cost is. Doesn't matter where the money's going to come from. If you're a special interest labor working group, you can count on me to be in your corner no matter what. That was our majority leader's message. Now, in the last week or so, keeping to the elephants in the room, might have just made some people from that side of the party a little uncomfortable and some other ones inside going, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the last week or so, from the other side of the aisle, the minority leader had a press conference talking about the budget and said, bring us to the table. We want a seat at the table. We represent people all over the state the same as you do. We have a voice. We have ideas. We want to work with you. Bring us to the table so we can make this thing better. Now, if you think about it, that sounds a lot like the message CCM's been putting out, right? Collaborative effort, bring us to the table. Does that sound familiar? Some of the ads and everything else? But I'll tell you this, his message was the polar opposite of ours. And here's why. As soon as he finished making his comments, a reporter said, so if you're brought to the table, you're willing to talk about and support some tax increases? And he said, oh, no, 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 mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. no way. Let's think about this table for a minute. We got a leader on one side that says, we're not gonna have a discussion about the number one driver of expense within our budget. That's off the table because we support the people who create that expense. So we're not gonna talk about that. And then we have a leader on the other side of the table that says, we're not going to talk about the number one driver of revenue in our budget. Because we support the people that have to pay that revenue, therefore that's off the table. Now when we talk about coming to the table from CCM, I will tell you this, I don't want to be at that table. Because that table is boring, and it's tired, and it's unproductive. That's a fact. I want to tell you what table that I would suggest that we be a part of. How about if we sit at a table with a city Republican mayor like Mark Bowden on one side, <laughs> and we sit at a table with a Democratic city mayor like Da Vinci on the other, and we sit at a table with first select woman Barbara Henry, a Republican on one side, and we sit at a table with a Democratic first select and Susan Bransfield on the other. And we have Leo Paul on one side, and we have Rudy Marconi on another. And I'm going to tell you what will happen at that table. 
every one of these items will be discussed. And they won't agree on everything. But here's what they'll do. They'll sit at that table for as many days as it takes, as many hours, as many weeks, as many months, until they pound out a solution that's in the best interest of the people that they represent collectively across the state. Because as local CEOs, that's what they have to do. They don't have time for silly season. gentlemen we can do so much better and I'll tell you the one thing I just said what that table will do let me tell you what it won't do I can guarantee you I've been around here three months and I've already seen it within this board when those conversations get tough those three Democratic representatives and those three Republican representatives they won't get up and go in a room by themselves and decide how they can lay out the other side or defend their position to the public in one-liners or use this to their advantage in the next election. They'll sit in that room and grind it out with their only focus being on the next generation. And we have to talk about these elephants in the room because the state of Connecticut is starving, starving for leadership. And the leaders of this state sit right here together and work collectively together and we're going to keep telling that story until somebody stands up and recognizes it that we can do so much better than what we've been doing let me move on to this the end of this of our vision as i said begin with the end in mind ccm is going to continue to work till we become a unifier of people who want to do the right thing not the political thing People who want to advance our communities, who want to grow economically, who want to take care of our most needy. We're going to do that in part by becoming a familiar face. We're assigning individual represent rep reps to each one of your towns. So we're there so you know exactly when you need something, who to call, how to link into them, who to text, who to email, who's going to be that rep that's going to help you through any process. We're going to show up. Maybe not everyone because we don't have the resources, but I can guarantee you somebody from our staff this year is going to be in one of your town hall meetings, if not several. Because we're going to understand what your issues are and what your unique needs are. And we're going to become a face within your community so your community understands that when they see that budget, that some of them actually have to have the community vote on the pass, and there's that line in it that says CCM, we're going to get to the point where they're standing up saying, you know, protect that. Because, boy, they really do good stuff for us. We know them. We want to make sure that you stay involved in them. Because the return that we're getting on our investment, that's the return that's making Warren Buffett in these. We're going to be a trendsetter. We're going to get out of our comfort zone. We're going to make people squirm a little bit in the chair. Because one thing that they're going to understand, and we're going to get the public to understand, is that we are Wall Street. We are mainstream, and we are seniors, and we are kindergarten children, and we're the guy down the street, we're the lady at the checkout counter at the grocery store, we're your neighbor next door, we're stay-at-home parents. We are CCM, we are your communities, and in FY 2016, we're building on our success. Thank you. here, uh, also leading the pack, getting us uh, to where we are today as well, and your staff. Uh, greatly appreciated. You all know Bruce will be uh, retiring, and but uh, we have David who will be uh, taking it over, so we're, all, we're good hands over there. Uh, we're, not, we're not concerned. So at this point, I think what I'd like to do is, on this note, we have some business to do, um, and I think, uh, can I get a motion to uh, adjourn the meeting? So moved. Can I get a second? Second. Any on, uh, ready to vote? Yes? Meeting adjourned.
Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, and thank you all for coming today. We appreciate the coming.